excited about being here, super excited about this opportunity to partner with the Hope Channel and uh, this particular program. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the series and kind of what we hope to accomplish in our time together. The series is going to be uh, about 12 parts. I've, I've done this series in as few as 10 and as many as 16. But as I've traveled around the world, and that's a, a luxury that I have, a privilege that I have, as you give presentations about God, about the Bible, about the church, about religion, you find that uh, for people who are not religious or who are not Christian or, or uh, raised in a religious context, you, you hear a lot of the same kinds of questions. And uh, I can almost anticipate when I sit down with someone, if they were not raised in a Christian environment or a religious environment, if I start talking about Bible, or the Bible or God or, or any such thing, I can anticipate that this will be a question that will be asked and this may be a question and this question and this question. And so over the last several years, what I had been doing is just sort of incorporating the answers to some of these questions into other presentations. And then the idea dawned on me a couple years ago when I was presenting in Australia why not just make a program that's basically all about those questions, the sort of questions that, that lots of people have, and I, I should probably pause here and just say, not just irreligious people. Uh, there are even people like myself, people of faith, and perhaps like most of you, who have a belief, they have a, a religion, a system of religion, but even we have questions about like simple things or, or seemingly simple things. For example, one time I remember when my son asked me, he said, I have two boys, 10 and 12. Uh, my oldest son, when he was about seven years old, he said, he said, Dad, why is God invisible? Well, that's a really good question, isn't it? And it's the kind of question that a child would ask and that a religiously minded adult might be inclined to say, oh, what a childish question. It's sort of almost poo-poo the question. But, but that's a great question, actually. When we are talking to people who are not inclined to believe in religious things or who do not come from a religious background, I mean, that's a really good question. Why is God invisible? Or, or what we're going to talk about tonight, why did God choose to communicate through a book? Of all things, why a book? And where does that leave the illiterate if God is communicating through a book? And a variety of other kinds of questions. If I get to talking to someone, whether I'm uh, sitting in a, a restaurant or, or riding on an airplane or whatever it might be, and we get to talking about God, invariably the question, why is there, if God is so much good, why is there so much suffering in the world? Why is there so much pain in the world? That's a great question. And it's a question that everyone asks, not just the irreligious, but also the religious as well. I've been a believer now, just to give you a little bit of background, uh, I've been a believer now in... Uh, the God of Scripture for about 17 years. Uh, when, when I became a uh, Christian, I was 24 years old. I was studying pre-medicine at the University of Wyoming. And to be totally honest, in perfect candor, if you would have asked me what I thought of religious people, and particularly Christians, prior to my becoming a Christian, I would have said a lot of very non-flattering things. I would have said they tend to be unsophisticated, uneducated, uh, just generally unaware, narrow-minded. I, I, it would not have been a happy description, a positive description. And I wish I could tell you that my earlier identification of what I would have thought Christians were has been entirely inaccurate. Uh, it was somewhat inaccurate, but my own experience now, sort of seeing the world from the other side as a person of faith and as someone who's been in this now for almost two decades, unfortunately, there are a great many Christian people and religiously minded people who frankly are just going through the motions. They were raised this way, their parents were this way, their parents' parents were this way. They just sort of take things for granted. There's so much suffering in the world, oh, that's a, you know, they have a very simple platitude, a platitudinous answer for that. God is invisible. That's a childish question. Why would God communicate through a book or a hundred other kinds of things? But I am persuaded that for those of us both inside and outside of the, the religious community that are really thinking, these are good questions that demand good answers. And uh, when I go traveling around the world and make presentations, I never get nervous about the people that ask lots of questions. Uh, let me just give sort of an example of that. In addition to, to traveling around and giving seminars like this and other seminars, I also run a school. 
in partnership with the ministry that we run, which is called Lightbearers, and the school is called Arise. In fact, the school just started yesterday. I spent all day yesterday teaching, got on a plane, and now I'm here. And uh, when we stand up and teach the students there at the Arise School, uh, a very interesting thing happens. Many students will just sort of take what you say. They'll just sort of say, okay, this is a person of authority. This is a person that I've looked up to. This is maybe a person that I've heard give sermons, and they just sort of take it. But then there's other people who ask questions, and it's very interesting. Many of the people that ask questions are often apologetic about it. They'll say things like, I I'm sorry, um, I'm just wondering about, and then they'll ask a question. And they almost have the sense that, like, I'm sorry to be asking the question, and I love to say to them, oh, no, 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 no. Don't be sorry about asking any question at all. The people that make me more nervous are not the ones who have lots of questions after having heard a religious or a truth-filled presentation. It's the ones who just take it. They just say, oh, a man up front wearing a tie and a suit standing behind a, a lectern, he, he said that, and it's just as if, because it's a part of like their culture, it's true. It must be true. Well, in this presentation, in this series of presentations, what we're going to try and do is investigate some of the common questions that I hear, and frankly, some of the most difficult questions to answer. Uh, I want to say right up front here that I'm going to try and provide questions, or answers rather, that I think are good answers. I think they're reasoned answers and biblical answers. But I will be totally up front with you when I say that even some of my own answers I don't find perfectly satisfying. I know I'm headed in the right direction, and I know that Scripture is, is giving us a general trajectory and sort of an outline of the answer, but some of these are tough questions. Like one of the questions that we'll look at tomorrow or the following uh, day is, why do innocent children suffer? And if anyone in this room or anyone outside of this room thinks that they have an absolutely watertight, perfectly clear answer on that one, then you should be up here, and I would love to be sitting at your feet. Because I'm going to give you what I think is the best answer that I know of and the best answer available. But even then, I still have some questions myself. The good news is, and we're going to talk about the Bible tonight, is that we don't need to be afraid to ask these kinds of questions. We actually find Bible writers, the writers of the Bible themselves, repeatedly asking God really difficult questions like, how long, God, is this going to go on? Right? So we should not be afraid of questions. We should be willing to hear the good answers. Um, now let me just sort of, after having said all of that, let me sort of introduce the series this way. Every one of us comes in here tonight and we have a battery of things, a number of things that we believe are true. Right? True. Now let me just sort of pause right there and introduce this idea of true or truth. If you ask most people what is truth, particularly religious, religious people, they might say something like, well, the word of God is truth. Or they might say, Jesus Christ is true. And those things would be biblically sound. I wouldn't argue with that. But I'm asking actually a simpler question or maybe just a different question. And that is, what is truth definitionally? Like, what does that word mean, the word truth? Uh, well, there are a variety of definitions, as you can imagine, but the definition that we're going to use here is a, is a fairly utilitarian definition. It's a good working definition. And the word truth, for our purposes, is simply going to be, this is our definition, correspondence with reality. Okay? Correspondence with what, everyone? With reality. In other words, if you said, oh, look, David Asherick is wearing a pair of white pants this evening. David Asherick is wearing a pair of white pants this evening. Would that be a true statement or an untrue statement? You would take that to be which? An untrue statement. Okay, I would agree with that. Now, provided that we agree upon our definitions of who David Ashrick is and what pants are and what white is, we could, we could evaluate the, the truth value of that statement. We could say, no, that's not at all true. The pants are darker than that. They appear to be dark gray or maybe even black. So we would say that is an untrue statement because it does not correspond with reality. If you were to say David Asherick has two sons, ages 12 and 10, that would be a true statement because it happens to correspond with reality. And again, as long as our definitions, we agree on our definitions, what is a son, who is David Asherick, what does it mean to be 10, what does it mean to be 12, we can say that statement is true or false. Now, every one of us in this room has hundreds of things, no, thousands, even millions of things that we believe are true. True. 
right? Very simple things. Like right now I'm taking for granted that language has meaning and that you can understand what I'm saying, right? I assume that language has meaning and I assume, it's actually not an assumption, but I'm taking tonight the, the reasonable assumption that language has meaning, that you can understand what I'm saying, etc. So we're not going to deal with all possible kinds of truth. We're just going to be dealing in this particular uh, series with religious truth. And uh, for those of you that are religious or even irreligious, we all have a sort of body of things that we believe are true. True about the world, true about God, true about the Bible, true about religion, true about the church. And uh, for our purposes here, we're going to use this, this table as, as uh, sort of an illustration of, of truth. Imagine with me that all of the things that you believe about God, about the Bible, about Christ, etc., etc., of religious truth, are all sort of assembled on a table. We'll just use this table here. It'll be very easy, very convenient. So well, you're going to have a variety of things on there. I'm going to have a variety of things on there. And, and whether you were raised in a Christian setting or a religious setting or you weren't, like, like I wasn't ra raised in a particularly religious context. Many of you may have been. Things just sort of end up on the table of truth. Some of those things that you believe are true probably got on that table when you were like five years old, right? For example, the story of, of David and Goliath. You know, you might have heard that if you were ra raised in a Christian home and you were very young and you believe that's a true story and that it teaches, you know, valuable lessons. And so that story and what that story represents made it onto the table and other things have made it onto the table. If you're a Muslim, certain things make it onto the table. And if, if you're a Christian, other things make it onto the table. And if you're a Hindu, still other things. And for most of us, the sort of table of truth, and, and a table's a really good analogy for this because... Tables accumulate things, right, in homes. If, if you just have any flat, horizontal space, it, at least in my home, it just starts accumulating stuff. The scotch tape will end up there. You know, a jacket can be thrown there at times. Mail will end up there. Magazines. And before you know, you just kind of have a bunch of stuff just sort of cobbled on a table. And then every now and again, it's time to clean it up. And then stuff will just reaccumulate. By the way, the trick to that is just to get rid of all of the flat spaces in your home. It really, it works, actually. <laughs> if you were to come to my house right now, this is a completely true story. For the last two and a half years, our living room has had no furniture in it. It's a totally true story. We have no furniture. We just sit on the floor. Well, that's not entirely true. We have one green chair in the corner. So if you come over, I can offer you a seat. Um, but it's really interesting. It's so easy to keep your house clean when there is no place to put anything. There's just... There's just no place to put stuff, so it just doesn't accumulate. It just doesn't come cluttered. And it also makes for a really good soccer place with my kids, and it's great for wrestling, too. You're not going to hit your head on a table because there is no table. Anyway, just a little housekeeping tip for you there. Martha Stewart's got nothing on me. Get rid of all the flat spaces. Okay, but anyway, back to the table of truth here. What happens for us from a young age or an older age, you know, I became a, a believer in Christ when I was 24, 24 years old. And since that time, I've been reading the Bible and I've been reading other books and I listen to presenters and sermons and, and whatever it might be, even in prayer or time in nature and reflection. And a variety of things just sort of get cobbled onto the table. There's nothing wrong with that, by the way. In fact, it's impossible to not have that happen to some degree. Here's my thesis, though. Having spent a lot of time with religiously minded people, and particularly Christians, I think that the table of truth, that's the language we're going to use here, the table of truth does not receive near the scrutiny that it should. Stuff just ends up there. It just kind of ends up on the table. And because many of us do not live... Um, the examined life, as perhaps we should, even the Bible says in the New Testament, examine yourselves whether or not you be in the faith. Most of us just sort of go through our lives and don't spend a lot of time really examining why we do what we do and how did we come to believe that, etc. What I'm going to propose here, and it's, it's a bit of a dangerous thing, but uh, I think it's adventuresome and, and uh, I think it's very helpful is that to some degree, in as much as it's possible, we're going to perform a mild thought experiment. I want you to try and take everything that you think you know, religiously speaking, about God, about the church, about the Bible, uh, etc., and we're going to just take it off the table. Now, that, that might strike some of you as like, well, how can you do that? There are things on that table that I know are true. I grant that. I concede that point. But here's the problem. <clears throat> 
The things that we love and that are really central and that we know are true in, in too many of our lives, they get cobbled together with just lots of other religious baggage, just other stuff that also happens to be on there. Maybe the way that your local church is, or maybe the way that your dad raised you. Maybe he was a little too strict, or maybe he was a little too lenient. And, and part of our sort of psychological, cultural Malou, the, the person that makes us us, it just kind of all gets cobbled on there, and then this thing becomes the truth to us. The problem is, and there are a great many problems associated with this, but one of the main problems is, is that it does not allow us to distinguish between those things that are fundamentally, essentially true, and things that are secondarily or tangent, tangentially important. Things that, yeah, that's important, but it's not centrally important. And I meet religious peoples all the time, well-meaning, wonderful, humble, sweet religious people who have a very difficult time distinguishing between something that's really, really important and something that's really not that important. It just happens to be the way that you like to do things or the way your local church likes to do things or the way your denomination likes to do things. So what I'm, what I'm going to sort of propose here, and it's a little wild, it's a little radical, I grant that is that in as much as it's possible, we're going to sort of clear the table, if you can just sort of imagine that. We're going to take everything off of the table. And, uh, of course, this is not actually possible. No psychologist or even neurologist would concede that this is actually possible. But as a thought experiment, we're going to say, what would it be like to just start over? To unknow, to unlearn everything that we think we already know and then start from scratch. And how would we start? What would we start with? What would be the most important, the primary thing, the cornerstone, the first thing that would go on the table? And so over the course of our time together, we're going to be putting things back on the table of truth, but we're going to be very careful about what gets on there. And we're going to examine the things that get on there, and we're going to be sure that, in fact, they belong on the table, number one, uh, that is that they're true, that they correspond with reality. And number two, that when we put a second thing on the table, we're going to look for coherence and for consistency between those things. Right? Because it just stands to reason, and I'm not going to explain logically why this is, but we cannot have two mutually exclusive things on the table of truth. Right? That's called a contradiction, and contradictions are naturally incoherent. They're, they're logical fallacies. For example, if you approached my wife and I and you said... Uh, oh, I hear you guys are expecting a child. And uh, I said, no, no, actually, we, we're not. We got two and we're done. And then at the very same time that I said no, my wife said, yes, yes, we got one in the oven. You wouldn't say, oh, that is so nice. You would be confused. What would begin to develop in your brain is what uh, is called cognitive dissonance. In other words, it would be like scrambled signals because those two things cannot both be true, right? Unless my wife maybe has another husband or maybe I have another wife or maybe I don't really know that my wife... You would try to make sense out of the fact that you just asked if we were expecting and I said no and my wife said yes. You wouldn't just assume that those two things that are actually mutually exclusive, she either is or is not pregnant, you wouldn't assume that they were somehow harmonizable or that they were consistent. And so when we start putting things on the table, um, and I'm kind of actually getting into a little bit of what we're going to talk about tomorrow, we're going to put some important things on, and then we're going to put other very important things on, but we're going to be sure that this is not only true in itself, but we'll test it by being sure if this is going to come on the table that it agrees with this. And in this way, we're going to sort of carefully, and there's no way, of course, that we're going to be able to rebuild the whole edifice of your religious belief system in 12 presentations. Not going to happen. But what we are going to do, by the grace of God, with any luck or with any fortune, what we will be able to do is show you how you should be thinking about your own religious experience. How you should be, whether you have one or don't have one, how would you either begin a genuine religious experience based not just on emotion or feeling, but really based on what's true? Does that actually correspond with reality? And uh, hopefully it will get you headed in the right direction so that in your own time, over the course, frankly, of the rest of your life, you will not be satisfied to live the unexamined life. 
but you will live a life in which you know why you be- rather you will live a life in which you know what you believe but equally as important you know why you believe what you believe and uh, i i wish i didn't have to I, I wish i could be so naive as to just think that all religiously minded peoples knew not only what they believed but also why they believed it by the way irreligious peoples are just as guilty of this you know they might not believe in god and uh, maybe they were raised in that context or they just came to believe it because they read some, you know, atheistic manifesto or something. But even a great many non-religious peoples, in fact, probably even to a greater degree in many instances, are not living genuinely, actually, thoroughly examined lives. And so we're going to ask a bunch of sort of difficult questions and some fun questions. And uh, we're going to try to arrive at the answers to those questions. But now you might be saying, well, who, who are you? Who... Who is David Asherick and what gives him the right to say what's true and what's not true? Well, right here at the outset is a huge, important thing that we have to sort of establish. And that is, um, how do we know what's true? Is there some kind of a standard? Is the standard just my experience or is the standard logic? What is the standard? And I'm going to put forth the sort of... Um, and it's audacious. I mean, it certainly is audacious. I'm going to put forward the sort of audacious idea here that, that the standard or the place to build from is Scripture, is the Bible. Now, I didn't spend the first 24 years of my life thinking that, and I know immediately people who are either watching the program or perhaps even some of you are going to be inclined to tune that out as naive, as unsophisticated or whatever, blah, blah, blah. I'm just going to ask you to bear with me, okay? Um, everybody starts somewhere, by the way. Everybody starts somewhere. And uh, I don't have the time tonight to describe to you all of the historical evidences and philosophical evidences and scientific evidences as to why I start with Scripture as my sort of bottom, my bedrock. Everybody has a bedrock, by the way, and mine is Scripture. Uh, there are good reasons for that, but, but what I want to do is actually going to be a little different than that tonight. What I want to do is actually ask the question, what is the Bible? What is this book? And uh, you might be thinking, well, that's such a simple question. I mean, who has that question? Well, to be honest, there are a great many of us. In fact, I go, I'm going to tiptoe out onto a limb and suggest that there are even many of us in this room here tonight who are religiously minded who would give really poor answers to the question, what is the Bible? Right? So we're going to start there. We're going to start with the question, what is this book about? And I know this is a good question, by the way, because when I first came to belief in God and in, in Christ, His Son, I had a particular picture of what I thought the Bible was, and a remarkable thing happened when I started reading it. I found out it wasn't what I thought it was. I thought it was going to be one thing, and when I started reading it, it turned out to be a really different kind of thing. And I think that many people today, perhaps even some of you in this room, are operating under a fundamental misunderstanding of what the Bible actually is. And the problem is, it's not just, that's a problem in and of itself, of course, but the real problem is, is that that then affects how you read it and what you're looking for. So we're going to ask some really simple questions to sort of start our presentation. We're going to ask some questions like, what is the Bible? What's it about? What is the sort of history of it? We're going to give the quickest version of that you've ever seen. We're going to ask the question, um, how did we get this book? It's an ancient book. It's a religious book. How did we come to acquire it? And then we're going to ask the question sort of, okay, who wrote it? Who's it about? And why was it written? And uh, this is going to be a bit of a whirlwind tour, but we're going to have a bit of a punchline here that I think is going to be super helpful for us as we commence with our presentation. So tonight, what is the Bible? Um, the first one here is very simple, uh, just sort of in its most basic evaluation. Uh, the Bible is not a single book, which can actually just in and of itself be a little almost deceiving. When you talk to somebody about the Bible and you pick it up, it sure looks like a single volume, uh, but in fact it's not. And that actually came as a bit of a surprise to me when I first became oriented to this book. Um, it's 66 books, in fact. And uh, rather than thinking of it as a single volume, you can think of it as sort of an encyclopedia. And those uh, books were not written by a single person. They were actually written by somewhere between 35 and probably not more than 40 authors. 
And those authors actually wrote in different places and at very different times. The Bible was written over a period of not less than 1,500 years, perhaps as many as 1,700 or 1,800 years. So we'll just say in round figures, more than 1,500 years. And it was actually written on three continents, the African, the European, and the Asian continent. And so what we have here is less a book and more an encyclopedia. And that alone is extremely helpful to us in sort of gathering what this book is and what this book isn't. Uh, the earliest parts of this book are contained, as you might guess, in the beginning, the book of Genesis, which that book just literally means, the book of beginnings. And then there are the rest of the books of Moses, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Those books with the book of Job are almost certainly the oldest books in the Bible. And then we come all the way down to the New Testament and we encounter the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and books like Revelation. And these are some of the newer books in the Bible, but even these would be almost, well, um, close to 2,000 years old. So basically what we're dealing with here is a book, an ancient book, that has writings dating from almost 4,000 years ago to about 2,000 years ago. And uh, that's sort of just a brief orientation as to what the Bible is in its, like, in, in its most basics. Um, but we're going to even kind of go a little bit deeper than that. We're going to ask the question now sort of like, okay, how did we get this book? Did God write the Bible? And uh, for some of you, it might be interesting to know that the answer to that is no, in fact. Uh, God didn't write the Bible. Now, there are actually parts of the Bible that God did, in fact, write. Now, I know that's an audacious claim, um, but the claim of Scripture is that God actually wrote, for example, the Ten Commandments with his own finger on tablets of stone. But for the rest of Scripture, um, God is not the author. Human beings were the authors. And uh, I've read lots and lots and lots of books on this and articles on this, and I've a statement that more clearly articulates this basic idea than the one I want to read to you right here from a woman named Ellen White. This is what she says. She says, the writers of the Bible were God's... Can you read that next word there? Pen men. Yeah, it's like a, it's a contraction of two words. Not, not God's pen, but God's pen men. Look, and it says, not his pen. Look at the different writers. Inspiration, that is the action of, of God inspiring, breathing on someone to write. Inspiration acts not on the men's words or his expressions, but on the man himself, who, under the influence of the Holy Ghost, is imbued with thoughts, but the words received, uh, but the words received the impress of the individual mind. The divine mind and will is combined with the human mind and will, thus the utterances of man are the word of God. Now that's really the point that we're after there. That the divine mind that God impresses, inspires, that he moves upon a man, and now in this marvelous, uh, inexplicable, synergistic connection, God has moved on a human being, and when that human being sits down to write, and, and many of these human beings were what we would call prophets, and a, a prophet, one of the older words for prophet was seer, S-E-E-R, which is just exactly what it sounds like, somebody who saw. They were seers. And uh, we know this because many of these seers or prophets, seers, they, they wrote down the, the things that they saw. They saw visions and they saw scenes almost in the, in the if you can just imagine, like a, like a cinema and God would show them these sort of cinematic things either of what had happened, for example, in the case of Moses, where he was shown creation, or in the case of prophets who were looking forward, things that would happen or that might happen or that could happen. So it's a little bit like going to see a movie, if you can imagine that. And then they would write about it. They would write about what they saw, what God showed them, and in so doing, their own individual personality and style and background and their own idiosyncratic personhood was preserved. And this is fascinating. So that when you read Bible writers, after you get sort of accustomed to the Bible, you've read quite a little bit of it, you can tell who's writing. If you just started reading to me from the Bible, I could say things like, many of you could also say, oh, that sounds like Paul. Oh, that sounds like Isaiah. Oh, that sounds like Moses. Well, here is a marvelous thing, something that I didn't know, something that I didn't understand. 
that it wasn't just God who was sort of writing from his throne, you know, and then, as it were, handing down these printed out sheets to men who were then stapling them into a book. Oh, no, 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 no. And right here is the point at which the Bible becomes a really cool thing and a really underappreciated thing. For too many religious people, uh, Christian people, and even irreligious people, there's a fundamental misunderstanding that the Bible is basically a list of how to live, a list of rules, a list of truths that were sort of, as it were, downloaded from heaven. But actually, that's not at all what Scripture is. There's parts that are, that are like that. For example, the Ten Commandments. But the, the bulk of Scripture, the lion's share of Scripture, is a bunch of stories. It's a bunch of what? Stories. And it's stories told by the people who experienced these things. Right? And so Daniel is telling the story of his own experience in the lion's den. It's a story. In fact, you could say that... Scripture is lots and lots and lots and lots of stories that are telling one fundamental story, one basic story. And we're going to get to that basic story in just a moment. But here's our point at this point. The Bible, to be sufficiently appreciated and understood, to be really grasped for what it is and not, not sort of valued for what it, what it isn't, is a human book and a divine book. It's a marvelous, wonderful mystery, but it has the fingerprints of humanity all over it. So far, so good. Now, that doesn't mean in any way to diminish it or to, to belittle it. Quite the contrary. It's a, it's a wonderful, mysterious, beautiful thing because it is really human, but it's also somehow divine. The Bible says it this way in 2 Peter chapter 1. It says, holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Spirit. And so we see both the divine part, the Spirit is moving, the Spirit's giving the visions, the, the Spirit is carrying them along, but it's the men, it's the person who's writing. So we have here a, connect, a synergy of human and divine. Now, that's going to become really, really important for us as we sort of continue on and try to understand what this book is. Okay, let's look at our next slide here. This being the case, then, the Bible is a record of mighty personal encounters with God and not a mere recital of propositional truths. It took me a while to figure that out, right? I just kind of thought that when I opened up the Bible, it would just say, okay, do this, don't do this, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that, don't do this, don't do this, don't do that. Like, and this is true, and this is true, and this is true. Like a bunch of Proverbs. By the way, there are a few sections of Scripture that are like that, like the Proverbs, that are just sort of, this is true, this is true. Statements of truth. But most of the Bible is not that way. When you pick up the Bible and you start reading it, it's stories. It's stories of, of histories and sometimes chronologies and events, and, and it's people who had personal, as it says here, mighty personal encounters with God, and as the, as the story sort of accumulates, as, as it sort of adds and adds, and we move through the two testaments, we'll talk about that in just a moment, it's kind of divided into two parts, as the story sort of moves, it cumulatively takes on a big story, a really big, awesome story, and I think that's what I've got here. If you wanted to sort of summarize what the Bible is about, you can actually do it in three basic concepts. Three basic themes. I call them the biblical tripod. The whole Bible basically hinges on three fundamental ideas, three basic plots or, or themes. And the first is creation. And not surprisingly, Scripture actually opens exactly that way. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And this is a, this is a consistent theme throughout all of Scripture. God as creator. We'll talk more about that in a future night. And, uh, but also, right out of the gate in the opening uh, book, Genesis, we're introduced not only to God in creation, but we're introduced to this really wild idea, if you think about it, that God is in conflict. Now, that just on its, that sounds weird. Like, who could withstand God? Why would God be in conflict with anything or anyone? Well, that's really the heart of the story. Not only is there creation and is there conflict, but now we're introduced to this idea of covenant. And uh, covenant is a really religious word that we're not going to spend a lot of time sort of unpacking right now. But I will say this. The essence of, of the word covenant here simply means a, a relational agreement. 
And we find God, in fact, this is a consistent motif throughout, throughout this book, or these, these books. God is making agreements. God is making covenants. God is entering into relationships with people. I mean, right out of the gate. God enters into a covenant with a guy named Adam, right? And God enters into a covenant with another fellow named Noah. And God enters into a covenant with a fellow named Abram later to become Abraham, and a covenant with David. And it's as if, it's not even as if, it is that, that God is depicted as exceedingly relational. And this will become super important for us tomorrow. Like God is establishing relationships with people. In the, in the midst of this sort of conflict with his enemy, and we'll talk a lot more about that in the future, the way that God is sort of solving the problem of conflict, the way he's sort of dealing with the conflict is through this idea of covenant. Well, there it is. Um, and then the Bible comes full circle back to recreation, which is just basically creation. So thematically speaking, really the Bible is about three things. God as creator, God in conflict, and then God as a covenant-making, covenant-keeping God, a relational God. Now, if we sort of further unpack that... Um, we can develop the story into sort of what you might call seven chapters. And this is actually the template that we use at the school that I run that I was telling you about earlier, Arise. And uh, basically what it is, is the story works like this. It moves from God in his pre-creation state. God is uh, in his essential nature, what he is. And then out of God's essential nature, which we're going to talk about tomorrow, he creates. And uh, here's where the conflict comes. Out of that comes a fall. And there's, there's conflict between God and his creation. And then God reaches out. And, and right here at the center, you can see this. The, the sort of fulcrum on which the whole story hinges is this idea of a covenant. This idea of a covenant. But it's really cool. And s the most amazing plot twist you could ever imagine. The way that God, according to scripture, the way that God sort of deals with the issue of conflict. And the way that he fulfills his covenant is he, by sending this Messiah figure, this Christ figure, who, in, again, the strangest plot twist imaginable, actually himself ends up being God, but God is a man. And in that way, a little bit like the Bible itself. As we just mentioned earlier, that the Bible is very much a divine document and very much a human document, and they, they synergize, they come together in an inexplicable way. It's just not... You couldn't divide between, okay, that's the human part, that's the divine part. They are, they are together. They are one. And in a very awesome way, Jesus, according to Scripture, the claim is that he's fully God and he's fully man. And Jesus comes, according to the story, to keep covenant with God and thus to rescue humanity. And in so doing, he then establishes a covenant community. And that, that, that community is called the church, right? And too often for us, when we think about the church, we think of a building, and we think of a steeple, and we think of pews, and we think of people in suits and ties. But none of this is exactly, is, is actually what was originally intended. Um, nothing against suits and ties, by the way. Um, or even pews, for that matter, though they're very funnily named, in my opinion. Um, the idea was that there was a community of people who were keeping covenant with God, but more than their keeping covenant with God, this was a community of people that believed that Christ had come and had kept covenant with God. And then, this is the awesome thing, and we'll talk about this, because the church gets way off the rails, and that's one of the questions we're going to ask. What's the deal with the church? Like, what's up with the church, right? And, uh, but anyway, so the church goes off the rails, you know, the, the wheels come off, so to speak. Um, but in a marvelous Again, plot twist, turn of events, unexpected a little move. God is actually recreating the earth through this thing called the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven by means of the church. Well, anyway, that's sort of the story. And I'm, I'm just sort of giving you a, a picture here of if you were going to summarize what the Bible is about, you would have these basic elements. God in his pre-creative state. Then he creates, there's the fall, which introduces conflict. God bridges that conflict with the covenant. Messiah, Christ, comes to keep covenant with God. He establishes a covenant community who believes in his covenantal faithfulness. And then that introduces recreation. That's kind of the story. But the cool thing is, is that it's not just a single plot. As we've already said, it's 66 books made up of lots of different stories. Hundreds of stories that are sort of cumulatively in their composite telling this story. Now, this is 
super helpful for us because too many people have read the right book in the wrong way. Reading the right book, right? But they read the Bible um, as I kind of thought it might be, and I know I've met many other people, even well-meaning, good, religiously-minded people that read it and they think, oh, this is a book of rules. This is a, this is a list of to-do and not-to-dos. When in fact, it's a story. It's a marvelous story. And God is the hero of the story. And people are writing. They're writing about the things that God has done and what has happened when people are faithful to God and unfaithful to God. And what's, what happens when God is faithful and people respond to God's covenantal faithfulness, etc. Well, the hero of the story is not just God in any old ordinary sense, but, but God in the human sense. God in the Christ sense. God becoming a man. And this is the grand mystery and I love to tell people at this point, I should just probably pause and say this. At this point, somebody might be sitting thinking, well, I don't even believe any of that stuff. I don't believe, well, at this point then, if you don't believe any of that stuff, no problem. Appreciate it for its aesthetics. Because I challenge you to find, just on an aesthetic level, a more beautiful story than the story of a creator who makes a thing whose creation then goes in rebellion against him, and the creator reaches out at the expense of his own life to preserve his rebellious creation. Are you with me on that? So what I love to do when I'm talking to my atheist friends or agnostic friends or people who are maybe from another religious persuasion is I say, hey, look, 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 look. I think the story is true. But even if at this point you're not willing to go quite that far and, and, and accept the truthfulness of the story, just appreciate it for its beauty. Just, just appreciate the aesthetics of the thing. What an awesome concept that the creator would extend himself in love to create a thing, that he would invest that thing with, with will and with intelligence and with volition, and then the thing would rebel against the creator, but the creator rather than, which of course he would have, the power to do it, the resources to do it, rather than, than eviscerating that thing or, or you know, annihilating it, he, he gives himself to it. He engages with it. He wins it. He woos it back to himself. And the cost of that wooing and winning the creation back to himself is his own life. That's a marvelous story. Are you with me on that? Beautiful, beautiful story. Even if somebody says, oh, I don't believe that at all. I don't believe there's a God. I'm, you know, whatever never seen one, if I can't taste it, smell it, touch it, whatever, it, is, it doesn't exist. Okay, fine, we can talk about that. But at least appreciate this story for what it is. And at this point, what we're simply trying to show is that there is, I don't want to say a right way and a wrong way because it will make me sound really pious and really professorial, and I don't want to come off that way. What I am trying to say, though, is that your experience with the Bible will be radically enhanced if you appreciate it for what it is. It's a marvelous story. And kind of the cool thing about it is that the Bible invites you to make your story this story. You read Daniel in the lion's den, and the, the, the implicit appeal is for you to have Daniel's experience, right? You read the, the stories in both the Old and the New Testaments, and the sort of implicit appeal of each of the writers is, hey, you're like Peter. There's, a, there's an element in which it's an ancient book and a very modern book, a contemporary book. It invites us to participate, to understand, and even to live this story. Well, one of the things that we encounter when we come to the New Testament is this really crazy idea. The book, of course, is a Jewish book. Um, virtually all of the Bible writers were Jewish. And when Jesus shows up in the New Testament, he has the temerity to tell the religious people of his day, the Jewish people, he was, himself was a Jew as well, he has the audacity to say to them, um, you're reading your own book wrong. Now, I'm, that's kind of what I'm doing here. I'm kind of going out on a limb and saying to you, many of you may be reading your own book wrong. I know that I spent probably the first several years of my own religious experience reading the right book in the wrong way, the good book in a bad way. And I'm trying to introduce to you here that that is not such a wild thing. It actually happened in Scripture itself. Jesus shows up and he would say things like this, John chapter 5, verse 39. He was speaking to the religious leaders of his day and he said, look, you guys search the Scriptures. Because in them you think you possess or have eternal life. Right? But these are they that testify of me. In other words, let me just translate that for you. You guys are reading the book because you think the book is the point. But the book is telling a story. And the story is about me. 
This is kind of getting back to the table of truth thing here. It's a little bit like they had so many things that had been traditions, and we could talk about the development of, you know, first century rabbinical tradition and how all of that happened, but we don't have time right now. All of these things sort of just get piled on here. You have this huge, big, cobbled mass of stuff on the table of truth for first century Judaism, rabbinical Judaism. And Jesus shows up and he's like, are you kidding? Look at all this stuff that's on here. Look at all this stuff that's on the table. And some of that stuff is valuable. A lot of that stuff is valuable. And he affirms the basic idea of where you get truth from. He's like, hey, you guys are searching the scriptures. You're on point with that. Yeah, good. That's a great place to start. That's where I'm starting as well. Um, and I'll justify that later in the series. But for now, we just have to start somewhere. He says, you're reading the book, and that's good. That's good. But you've misunderstood the book. You think that the book itself, somehow in reading the book and possessing the book in almost a sort of lucky charm, sort of a talisman type way, that this benefits you. And oh, I tell you, there's a great many of us here today who have this same relationship with this book. <laughs> we, the Bible is the most, oh, it was the first book published on a printing press. It certainly is one of the most widely uh, possessed books. Um, but I don't think it's one of the most widely perceived books, even by those who possess it, if you know what I mean. Uh, so you kind of have this book, right? And Jesus is saying the thing is not a talisman. It's not, a, it's not an artifact that you keep close to you and you read it and there's some merit or benefit in the book. He says, it's telling a story. And I'm the hero. The story's about me. What a wild thing to say. I mean, just appreciate that for the really revelatory and revolutionary thing it is to say. I mean, you're saying to a bunch of religious people, you're reading your own book wrong. The book is about me. I mean, you could accuse Jesus of a great many things, but, but timidity would not be one of them. I mean, the guy is just bold. He's just absolutely audacious. I'm the one that your book is about. Now, I have come to believe that that claim is true. And um, Jesus, man, on another occasion, just very quickly... Sermon on the Mount, stands up, he begins to preach, and he can't stop saying this thing, this thing, he just can't stop saying it. It's his first public address, and this is the thing he can't stop saying. You have heard, but I say. I mean, just wild. He's just setting himself in just absolute contradistinction to the religious leaders of his day. You have heard that it was said by them of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whoever looks on a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. You have heard that you shall not commit murder. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause has committed murder already. So it's really this fascinating thing where Jesus sort of shows up on the scene and he is what the book is about, but people have misread the book. They've misunderstood the kind of book that it is. And so he has to sort of reorient them to their own scriptures. And you find him over and over again, passage after passage after passage, where Jesus will say things to them like, have you never read in your own scriptures the stone that the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner? That's in your Bible. People would come up and say, what is the great commandment in the Bible? They're trying to trap him. They're trying to trick him. They were trying to figure out which rabbinical school does he fit into. And he would say, well, what do you, what do you think? How do you read the scriptures? Right? Again and again, what Jesus is trying to do, and, and if time allowed, I could show you passage after passage after passage. You could probably show me some, where Jesus is basically trying to show them, you're reading the, your own book wrong. This, there's a better way to read that book, and this is how you read it. There's one particular part of this where, where Jesus is actually after his resurrection. He's walking with some disciples. This is in the book of Luke, the gospel of Luke. And it says a marvelous thing. It says that the people were sort of sad. They were some of Jesus' disciples and they were forlorn that he had been crucified because they didn't think that was going to happen. They thought he was the Messiah. They thought he was the warrior king. And yet he'd been crucified and they were trying to put the pieces all together. And then it says an interesting thing. It says that, that this Jesus, who at this point was not yet disclosed to them, he reveals who he is. And then it says he opened their book and showed them in the law, the prophets, and the Psalms all the things about himself. In other words, he basically opened his book, the Jewish book, to a bunch of Jews. And he said, let me teach you how to read this thing. And then it's like their eyes were open, and it says that their, their, their hearts burned within them. Did not our hearts burn within us, they said. It was almost like the scales were falling off of their eyes, and they were reading a book that they'd had forever. And they realized, 
We've been reading this thing all wrong, right? Now, many of us, our experience might not be so dramatic, but I'm going to try to demonstrate to you here that there is a great way to read this book. And here's a way to sort of get you oriented. I've mentioned the sort of two testaments, the Old and the New Testament. They're not really halves because the Old Testament's about two-thirds of the book, the two-thirds of the Bible, and the New Testament's about one-third. But here's a really cool way to keep Jesus at the center of the book, the center of the story. And that's to read it as the law, that's the writings of Moses, which you've already mentioned, as the foundation for Christ. Now watch what happens. The, the history books, the Chronicles, the Samuels, the Kings, and others, these are preparation for the coming Christ. Poetry, such as the Psalms and Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and Song of Solomon, these are aspiration for Christ, a longing, a poetic longing for Christ, even a musical longing for Christ. And prophecies is when God revealed to those prophets, the seers, the expectation of coming Christ. Now, when you read the Old Testament this way, the whole thing is built around what figure? It's built around Christ, right? You have foundation for Christ and preparation for Christ and aspiration for Christ, and then the expectation of Christ. Well, the, the same kind of thing happens when you come to the New Testament. When we come to the New Testament, the Gospels are Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. This is basically the story of Christ. Everything that the Old Testament had looked forward to, now the hero of the story has arrived. God's covenant has come. This is a really cool concept that we may not be able to develop here in this series, but I'll come back for another one if you want. God's covenant has arrived in human flesh just wild, a wild idea. The agreement shows up, and it's in flesh and blood, right? And that's the gospel. It's the manifestation of Christ. And then in the book of Acts, it's just exactly what it sounds like, the actions of the church. I just recently preached through the whole book of Acts, me and a team of my friends. And it's just the church going through basically the process of bringing this truth of, of the Christ to the Greco-Roman world. And then you have much of the New Testament of these what are called epistles or letters. And that's basically Paul and Peter and James and others writing saying, this is how you apply what we learned in the life of Christ, application of Christ. And then finally, the Bible closes with the book of Revelation, which is the consummation in Christ. The whole story ends. It's a happy ending, by the way. I thought that'd be a great bumper sticker. You could maybe get one made that said something like, you know, I've read the end of the book and it's a happy ending or something, something like that. Um... Every now and then I'll, read, I'll get a book and it'll just be way too big, like 900 pages. And I've read the first 50 or 100 and I'm like, ah, I'm sort of not feeling it. And um, so I just like to go read the last chapter just to see like... And as sometimes I go read the last chapter of the book and I'm like, oh, I like the way this book ends. Maybe I'll read the rest of it too. But too often I just read the last chapter and I'm like, okay, I, I, I know this story. But when you go read the last story of the Bible, it ends really well. It's a happy story. And so in each of these instances you have Jesus sort of sort of at the center, not sort of, but fundamentally at the center. One of my um, favorite Christian scholars is a guy by the name of N.T. Wright, and he's wrote a number of, of really good books, actually. And uh, in this particular book that I was reading, he says this, quite fascinating. He says, when we turn to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, those are the Gospels, we discover that they think it's important to retell the history of Israel. That's the Jews. To retell the Jewish history to show... The story of Jesus is the story in which that long history, warts and all, reaches its God-ordained climax. And then he says, and this is actually the, basically the title of the book, he says, the story of Jesus is the story of how Israel's God became king. Now this is quite a fascinating idea, because when Jesus shows up, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John portray Jesus in sort of two really interesting roles, very significant theological roles that I don't have time to develop, but you're just going to sort of believe me on this, trust me and trust N.T. Wright on this. Um, one story is that Jesus shows up as Israel. He shows up as, as I mentioned a moment ago, the covenant in flesh. Israel, God had established a covenant with the Jewish nation, and they had at times kept it, but it was often uh, the, the history of the Old Testament, the, the, the stories of the Old Testament is a successive failure, 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 failure to keep covenant with God. When Jesus shows up, one of the stories that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are all telling is that Jesus shows up, and wherever Israel had failed, and in some striking historical similarities, really awesome stuff, particularly in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus succeeds. Where they fail to keep covenant, Jesus keeps covenant. 
where they had been rebellious, Jesus is obedient. And Jesus takes on this, this life in the New Testament where he becomes Israel. That's one of the stories. Another interesting story is that not only is Israel supremely significant to the whole story of Scripture, but so is Adam. And uh, Jesus shows up, not just as the new Israel, but as the new Adam, as the new humanity. And he shows up, and where Adam had failed, and there's so many, again, little historical similarities here. Adam failed in a garden. Jesus was faithful in a garden. You know, these cool things where Jesus shows up, not just as the new Israel, but as the new Adam. And here's a cool thing. These are the two entities, the two primary entities in Scripture that are called the Son of God. Israel is my son, Moses said to Pharaoh. Let my firstborn go. My son, let him go. And Adam was the son of God. And this is, this is the very title that the New Testament uses for Jesus. He's the son of God. Well, that was making a profound statement. He's Adam. He's a new humanity. He is a new history for the human race. And he's Israel. He's a new history for the nation of Israel. Well, this is just sort of getting us started here, and it's already been a little dense. Have you learned anything tonight? Good. I don't say you've been dense. I say that I don't, I don't sense that at all. Um, but what we're dealing with here is we're dealing with, we've got to start somewhere in our sort of quest for truth. And tonight we ask the question, what is the Bible? And in, in, a, in a short sentence, the Bible is a series of stories, hundreds of stories, that tell the story. And the story is the story of Jesus Christ. He said, you search the scriptures. You're doing well. Good job. Good for you. But in them you think you have eternal life. He's basically saying it's not just a list of rules. It's not just a list of items. It's not just, no, 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 no. That's about me. There's a story that's being told and that story is about me. And so as we start putting things back on our table of truth, one of the first things that we're going to put on there is the Bible. But one of the other things that we're going to put right on there is the Bible, when properly read, when properly understood, is the story about Jesus. And that is going to become a hugely important building block for us as we continue. So it's been awesome to be here with you tonight, and I'd like to just have a closing prayer with you if that's okay. Father in heaven, great to be here, great to have arrived and made the flight and uh, tonight, as we just sort of begin this journey, the first of 12 parts, um, yeah, it's going to be helpful to us to understand what this book is and what this book isn't. And as we've seen tonight, it's a story, uh, not just any ordinary story, a beautiful, composite, human, divine story that is absolutely climaxed in the man Jesus. And Father, as we continue to build and to add to that table of truth, uh, help us to keep this book in its proper understanding and its proper uh, orientation so that we will read the good book in a good way and that we'll read the right book in the right way. Thanks, Father, for having brought us here tonight and get us home safely. Back here tomorrow is our prayer in Jesus' name.